All right. Good morning, Church at the Crossing. How is everybody? Okay, good stuff. Y'all ready to worship God this morning together? Would you stand with me? And as we were just preparing for this week, come on, we're in the middle of our In the Middle series, week three. Has anyone been challenged, stretched by this series? Um, this morning, I just have a feeling and an expectation that God wants to do some incredible things. And so I wonder what it would look like if we met him right from the beginning of, okay, God, we're open to whatever you have. You know, a lot of times we have the warm-up song, right? Like the first song that gets us in the mood. The second song is like, okay, I'm feeling it a little bit more. And by the third song, we're ready to worship God. I wonder what would happen if we just agree collectively like, hey, I'm not going to wait for the third song. I'm saying yes to God right now. I believe that you have some things for me. Is anyone in agreement with me this morning? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it says in your word that you inhabit the praises of your people, God, which tells me that that's where you live and dwell. God, I pray that this morning that our hearts are set towards you, God, that we're ready to worship you, God. We're not worshiping out of circumstances, God, but we're worshiping out of your presence and your goodness and your glory and your sovereignty and your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, I pray that something happens today inside of each and every one of us, God, that challenges us, that stretches us closer to you. Father, would you inhabit our praises? We love you. We thank you. And it's in your son's name the church says, amen. Let's worship together this morning.
David's prayer in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 10. It says, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. See, there's this reoccurring theme in today's worship of of honestly not allowing circumstances to define our worship. Because if we could just be honest this morning, I think a lot of times, right, like, like we'll worship God when things are going good, right? Like it's super simple to be like, God, you're good and you're great to be praised when you know where your next meal's coming from. It's easy to say, God, you're good and your mercies endure forever when you do get the promotion. You get what I'm getting at? And so what happens is a lot of times I think that we've developed this circumstantial worship that's limited to our last taste of victory. And I believe that there's something inside of us. The thing about David, David in front of the whole assembly was worshiping God and declaring his majesty and saying how great he was. But if we were to do a timeline of David's life, how many people know that David messed up a lot? That David had went through some stuff. So David made mistakes, and a lot of times, I think even our last mistake defines our worship this morning. And so it's really hard for us to, to be like, okay, God, are you really that good? Because just last night I was doing this, or just last week I said this about you, or I had this opportunity and I didn't take it. And so we disqualify our worship based off of our circumstances, or we define our worship based off of our circumstances. But there's something that happens when the children of God would recognize the majesty of God and say, regardless, God, when we're singing and declaring that you're never going to give up, you know, I don't think that we're doing that to remind God. I think, in fact, we're doing that to remind ourselves. See, it's not the amount of faith. It's the object. I could just be honest, because I fall in this category. I'm not beating up anybody that's not holding the mic as well. So many times, man, I, even the whole preparation to a Sunday morning is based off of, like, how good was it, God? Was I good enough for you to show up? Like, like God, did I say the right things? Did, did, did I do exactly what you asked me to do? something that happens when his people can just recognize that it's all on him. It's his glory. It's his majesty. It's his name. I believe wholeheartedly that God's just looking for a people that would not worry about making themselves famous, but get out of the way and say, look at our God who is great and greatly to be praised. So I kind of want to bring it all back down. I don't want to go into the hype of do that. But as the lights come on, I just want to have a moment with you guys, and I want to go back into, honestly, probably one of my favorite chorus, His Majesty. came out back in 2004. But there's just something simple about recognizing God's majesty. Can we do that together collectively? If for you that means closing your eyes, close your eyes. If for you that means uh, sitting down and being reverent before the Lord in that manner, do so. You know, if this is a moment for you to challenge and stretch your faith and say, God, I'm going all in. I'm going to raise my hands. I'm going to worship you. Then I would encourage you to do so. But would you lead us in majesty? And can we just invite God's presence to overwhelm us and to consume us together? We're singing majesty.
allowing us access into the holiest of holies, God. God, I pray that as your people, we're constantly reminded of your goodness, of your grace, of your mercy. Would you come and be with us this morning? We love you. We thank you. And it's in your son's name, the church says, amen and amen. Can you give it up for Jesus just one good time? As you're seated, make a friend on the way down. Invite him to Shoney's, which I've been told is 2.6 miles away, not 3.2. So thank you for that. As everyone's settling in, if uh, you're new here with us, if you've never visited with us, we have a junior high small group that happens right now. So 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, you guys are dismissed. You can go out to the foyer, meet Carl and Courtney and the rest of the crew. Y'all give it up for junior high. What's up? this weird phase where I'm like doing throwbacks. You know what I'm saying? Anyone remember the hoodie t-shirts from back in the day? Oh, yeah. Next week I'm preaching in a starter jacket, I promise. <laughs> but uh, thank you guys, man. We're so honored to have you. Um, three weeks into this thing, man, not just into the series, but into this new location. Are you guys excited about what God has going on at the crossing? Incredible, incredible stuff. Um, just uh, if you haven't been able to join us before, or if this is your first time, we uh, truly do consider it an honor that you would uh, decide to worship with us this morning. We know that you could be anywhere else on a Sunday morning, but you saw fit to hang out with us. And I believe that it was not by mistake, but it was by design that God would have you here this morning. Because when you open up God's word, God's word has a way of getting into you and challenging you. And so we're glad that you're here. If you are a first-time guest inside of your worship guide, there's a connect card. We'd love to connect with you. We don't sell your information. And we do a crazy amount of emails. But we do follow up with you because there's a lot of people that are just coming around and wanting to know what the next steps are. Like, how do I get involved? What's going on? What are you really about? Uh, you know, just any kind of question you can come up with. So we'd love for you to fill that out. Also, coming up soon, um, we have Connect Night. Who's been to a Connect Night? Anyone been to Connect Night? That's what I'm talking about. Don't we take care of you? We feed you well. I'm saying we bounce between Dickie's Barbecue and Olive Garden and some others. So, uh, man, uh, Connect Night for us is our first initial step of connecting with you. And so if you've been around for a while and you've been kicking the uh, tires and checking it out and being like, you know what, I want to find out more about how the crossing functions or I'm ready to go all in and take my next step into membership, jump into small groups, just hear more about your heart and your vision. So it's the fourth Sunday of this month. All you have to do is either on a connect card or online, let us know that you're coming so that we can prepare with the right amount of food because ain't nobody like a party where the food runs out. Come on, man. Y'all been to those ones? I, I taught our youth well when I was the youth pastor. Um, pizza parties, don't ever grab a plate. You know what I'm saying, Jordan Johnson? You remember that. You don't grab a plate because then no one knows how many pizzas, <laughs> how many slices you've had. You can be like 10 in. <laughs> Anyways, um, sign up for Connect Night. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Also, Summer at the Crossing's kicking off. How many people remember Summer at the Crossing? We do some events together. We hang out. We do life together. So uh, this will, I guess, be the second public announcement of it. But as of uh, this past week, we locked in our date to rent out Waterworld. Come on, Waterworld, Dothan's best beach. Uh, <laughs> I think, is that in their advertising? Do they say that? Yeah. The greatest thing about Dothan's beach is that you don't leave with sand in places that you don't want it. So, um, but uh, Waterworld is our gift to you guys. I was trying to look for dates. Here we go. Um, it is going to be the last Sunday in June, which is June 30th at 515 to 815. We provide a meal for you. So all you got to do is show up and hang out. We had a good time last year at Waterworld. Anyone go to Waterworld last year with us? It's a good time. It's a great place to invite your friends and bring them. Um, I went on the Great White, you know, that big, 
that big slide. I went, man, I had a little friend that went with me, and uh, man, uh, I don't know if he realized that the, the weight ratio was, <laughs> when I say a little friend, I mean homeboy probably weighed like 27 and a half pounds, which can be found in my kneecap. <laughs> so anyways, I was like, hey, bro, let's go down this thing together. I, I kid you not. Um, we're not going to use his name or anything, but, but I love the little guy. Uh, the first initial drop, he was smiling, went out like a light, passed straight out. <laughs> straight up. Missed the whole ride the whole time. I'm just like smacking his face a little bit like, hey, buddy, wake up. And he, and he comes up at the end. He's like, ah! So, and then I uh, did the road to Romans, led him to Christ. <laughs> did you see your life, son? Anyways, um. Waterworld. In the middle, we're in week three. Uh, just to recap, week one, we really recognize that we spend the majority of our life in the middle. Can anyone recognize that and say, yes, you're absolutely right. We left the beginning at some point. We hang out in the middle forever, and then there comes the end. And so we understood that we occupy the middle personally as people, as a season in life that we just stay in. It's, it's really in between the dashes of the date that you were born and the date that you'll die that you spend the most of your time. Last week, we just came out and, and we, we talked about how God has always been looking for a people to occupy the middle, right? Like the church occupying the middle, positioning ourselves right in between two opposing views or, or, or putting ourselves in the breach in a wall as Moses did as he interceded for his people. And so we talked about occupying the middle. And I kind of want to circle back around this morning in a, and hit a little bit more of a personal subject so let's look at our main text, and then we'll pray and jump right in. If you're following along, you can follow along on the uh, Life App Bible or uh, inside of your Connect uh, or your worship guide. You can jot down some notes. Deuteronomy 2, verses 1 through 7. This is Moses talking. He says, Then we turned back and set out towards the wilderness along the route of the Red Sea, as the Lord had directed me. For a long time we made our way around the hill country of Seir. Then the Lord said to me, you have made your way around this hill country long enough. Now turn north. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful again for your word. It's your word that brings correction and change. God, we're thankful that you're with the broken and the downtrodden and those that are hurt and lost and that you're with us today. And so I pray that as we get into your word, that it gets into us, God. Everything that I've prepared, I submit over to you, God, because your word doesn't return void. We want to hear from you. We love you. We thank you. And it's in your name. The church says, amen. amen. So our text this morning, Moses is referencing the 40 years that the Israelites spent in the wilderness after the exit from Egypt. And so if anyone is in, uh, kind of knows the story that you can find all throughout Exodus, that the children of Israel, they were in captivity, they were in bondage to Egypt. And so they cried and they complained and they, and they cried out to God asking for, for him to send a savior and someone who would rescue them. And, and Exodus tells us that God heard the cry of his people and he responded. And there's some incredible things that happen in Exodus as they leave slavery and bondage and step into freedom. The Red Sea splits. They walk across on dry water. And so Deuteronomy is just referencing this time. And for, for some of us that know this and others that may not, the Israelites spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. See, the wilderness was a testing time. In fact, the Israelites, they found themselves there as a result of themselves. And so what do you mean by that, John? If you were to study text and find out why was it a 40-year journey, because geographically that, that trip should have only taken like 11 days. But it was a 40-year journey. Can you imagine taking 40 years to get to Orlando? You know what I'm saying? Like 40 years. I mean, some of us feel that it takes 40 years. It's really like, what, five and a half hours, four if you're driving fast? Hey. No, just kidding. We follow the laws in this church. All of them. <laughs> but they were there as a result of themselves. So what do you mean, John? Numbers 32, 13, it gives us a glimpse into why there was a 40-year period for a generation of people. Listen what it says. This isn't in your notes, and it won't be on the screen, but it says, The Lord's anger, it burned against Israel. And he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years. See, God was, was, was angry with his people. Why? Because God is more concerned with who we are becoming rather than where we are going. 
And so there was this testing time going on for his children because there were children that were disobedient. All it took was Moses leaving them for a couple of days, spending 40 days up on a mountaintop. And guess what they do? They ask Aaron, like, yo, uh, give us some golden calf so that we can worship. Like there was, there was an anger in God. And I tell you this, Exodus 34, it tells us that God is a jealous God. There are some translations that go on to tell us that he's jealous about his relationship with you. You know, we were just saying, king of my heart. Can I tell you this, that God doesn't just desire, he needs to, he longs to be first. That nothing comes before him. No job, no relationship here on this earth. Nothing comes before God. That's the glory and the majesty of his name. It's his sovereignty. It's, it's who he is. And so, so he was angry with his people and he made them wonder for 40 years. And let's just bring it into real context. Some of us are like, yo, God must be angry with me. Because your boy's been wondering for seven years. Or some of us find ourselves in this season, right? Like, like occupying the wilderness, if you will. See, if we're in a delayed season, there may be a lesson to be learned. And so let me encourage you to lean in to counsel and, and wise, wise counsel and wisdom. Because you may find yourself circling the same problem over and over and over and over again. Because it's really God giving you the same opportunity to get out of it over and over and over and over again. How many times, any video game players? Come on, man, what's up? Video games? Anybody? All right, let's go a little bit old school. Super Nintendo, Nintendo, Nintendo 64, come on. That was real video games. I showed my son Mike Tyson's punch out. He was like, Dad, is this all you guys had? I was like, man. So I was like, no, we got Excite Bike too. And I put him on Excite Bike and didn't like that. Anyways, there's something about video games, right? Like you get, you get to the same point, you get to the same part over and over again. You can't get past it, you can't get past it, you can't get past it. And then all of a sudden, there's an opportunity that you didn't recognize the first time that you would face that obstacle. See, in real life, there's some opportunities that we face the same thing over and over and over and over again because our perspective is more so on the problem than it is the presence of God. And we struggle to get out of a season even though God's like, here's the answer. I've been here the whole time. I've been here with you. And so if we're in a delayed season, there may be a lesson to be learned. And so I, I don't want you to think I'm beating you up or I'm angry with you. But it's in God's grace and his mercy that maybe this time circling around, you've paused long enough to sit with us today and say, okay, I'm leaning in, I'm listening, there's something that I must be missing. So what is it? What is it? Well, this morning I want to talk about direction in the middle. Did you hear in our main text, God makes this statement to Moses where he says, you've made your way around the hill country long enough. Now it's time to turn north. So what does that mean for us today, John? To bring it into real context, I believe that some of us have made our way around this journey long enough. And God's saying, today's the day that I really want you to step into true freedom. See, here's what happened with the children of Israel. They were set free, but inside they still found themselves bondage and in captivity to the life they knew in Egypt. See, a lot of times we've moved from being captive and in, in, in bondage of our sin to being free in Christ, but it's been so long that we were in sin, we have no idea what it feels like to be free. And so this is part of the journey. This is that sanctification process that's like, you know what, John? I'm not where I used to be. I'm definitely not where I want to be, but there's something that God's stirring inside of me. There's, there's something happening. Would you send some people around me to help like, like guide me through this? I believe with everything in me this morning that God is prophetically saying to his children, you have been stuck in this season long enough. It's time to turn north. You've been here long enough. You've dealt with depression long enough. You've dealt with anxiety long enough. You've dealt with being the outcast long enough. You've dealt with being told that you would never amount to anything long enough. You've dealt with this long enough. It's time to turn north. And some of us, we've circled the same thing over and over again. And what God is looking to do is to develop a people that won't be defined by circumstances, but will be defined by the presence of God. And something happens when we respond to the word of God when he says, you've been here long enough. And so I'm wondering, is there anyone this morning that sure says, yep, I've been there long enough. I'm ready to hear from God this morning. I'm ready to hear from him. And so let me give you some things that we do in the wilderness when we're looking for direction out of a hard season. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to be out of the middle, but what I am saying is that the middle can move. The middle can move. Some of us, our middle has been defined by one single moment. 
but you can move to the next chapter. I mean, physically, the church, we've moved to the next chapter. Three weeks ago, we moved to the next chapter. We had been there long enough. It was time to move north. I don't even know if geographically that makes sense, but that'd be super cool if it was. Depending on where you're looking, we move north. <laughs> but here's some things we do in the wilderness. This is where I believe that we can connect as a people, as, as those that have problems, as those that have issues. First thing we do in the wilderness when we're circling the same thing over and over again is we complain. Come on, where are my complainers at? <laughs> you ain't got to identify yourself. It's okay. But it's almost like a default response. <laughs> complain. We deal with something longer than we want to, we complain. We deal with something that we don't know how to get past, we complain. We deal with something that we didn't see coming, and so we complain. And this ain't even like one of the things I wanted to say, but if we're not complaining, we're probably making excuses. So either way, we're finding ourselves in a place of limbo in this season in the wilderness. We complain. Look in Exodus. It's no different for the children of Israel in Exodus 17.3. It says, but the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? They complained. They got thirsty. I mean, I remember there was a time where the excitement and the exuberance of a life with God and living out this calling was a response of, like, God, I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything. And so he calls me somewhere and he puts me somewhere and then I complain. <laughs> like, God, I just want to do what you call me to do, but, you know, I don't really like dealing with so-and-so. Like, could I maybe do, do the thing you call me to do, but, like, maybe you could, like, I don't know, maybe not seven plagues, but maybe just, like, like a stomach virus so so-and-so doesn't show up. Let's just be honest, man. I think one of our biggest complaints is probably against each other. <laughs> against the person that we go to church with, the person that we work with. Come on, work. <laughs> if so-and-so would take care of their stuff, we would be okay. When things get hard, we tend to complain. When things got hard in the desert, they tended to complain. And here's the deal with a complaint. A complaint is dealing with what's setting before you presently. Without any reminder of what you just faced in the past, all that they needed was some water in the desert. They were willing, and there's other verses in Exodus that says, man, like, what'd you do, bring us out here to starve us? At least back in Egypt, we have fish, and we have food. Could we just go back? See, their complaints and their perspective of the middle led them to want to go back to what God freed them from. Are you getting this, friend? <laughs> a lot of times when it gets hard in the middle or if we're complaining or seeing what currently is facing us, we'll sacrifice the freedom that we are experiencing to go back into the comfort of the season that God took us out of. <laughs> I mean, we can laugh all we want at the Israelites. Like, they're crazy. Why would they want to leave freedom to go back into slavery? <laughs> and God's kind of like, why would you? Didn't I free you from that addiction? Didn't we deal with that? Didn't that get nailed to the cross? And you're telling me because things are getting a little hard and because some people don't like you, you want to go back to that? Are you getting this? Direction in the middle. Here's your first lesson. Stop complaining. That was a good amen moment. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah. Here's the other... Th the other thing in the wilderness, and as far as seeking direction in the middle, and we've talked about it a little bit, to, but to put it in context, we feel like we're walking in circles. You know, I was thinking about that this week, that when we talk about directions in the middle, that I think a lot of times, Sunday morning, a group this size, that there are people present, that this has been your journey with God. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh man, things are rough. Boom, Sunday morning, I'm back worshiping God Monday. I don't really like my job. <laughs> Sunday, I'm back worshiping God Monday. Got to deal with that. Does anyone ever feel like you're just spinning in circles and you're never making progress anywhere? And honestly, it diminishes our faith to just one day. Oh, if I could just get to Sunday, then Monday and through Saturday doesn't 
really have much of an effect on me. Can I tell you that you are more effective on your Monday through Saturday reaching people for God than we are on our Sundays? You have six days, six other opportunities to reach people that are lost and hurting, but we're walking in circles time and time again. Deuteronomy 1-2 actually gives us the length of that journey in the wilderness where it says it takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount, by the Mount Seir Road. So this morning, I just wonder, have you ever felt like you're not making any ground? But let's make it a little bit more personal to, to, to our everyday lives. So maybe you're not making any ground in your faith. Maybe you feel like you're not making any ground with your kids. Come on, parents. <laughs> Yo, I love my son. I think he's probably in here somewhere, so I ain't, ain't, ain't knocking him. But, hey, buddy. <laughs> you know how he gets excited? Because I told him, like, if you don't know. Uh, so I'm a PK. Any pastor's kids in here? Come on, where are my PKs at? Yeah! Didn't we always become some kind of example on Sunday morning? Dad, I love you, man, but you turned me into an example for just something, <laughs> you know? And so, not that there was any shame or anything on that, but I want my son to love church and feel like it's somewhere he wants to be and not get all caught up in, like, whether or not he's an example. So this is Tyler's part-time job. If I mention him, he gets five bucks. <laughs> so the adverse effect to that is that now Tyler's looking for reasons to become an example on Sunday. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dad, is this good enough? <laughs> Just kidding. You got a birthday next week, boy. 15, week after next, the greatest Father's Day present is sitting right there. I love you, boy. Hey, you can give me $5 back for saying that. That's, <laughs> that's pretty nice. But if you felt like you've never made any ground, even as a parent with your kids, and I tell you, and I'm being completely transparent, open, and honest, and, and I love my son, and honestly, he's literally one of the greatest things that could have ever happened to me and Brandy and living with us full time. But there have been seasons <laughs> where I just feel like I'm walking in circles with him, man. And here's the deal about walking in circles as a parent. You'll slip and say something you didn't mean. And then you've just delayed the process and your son learning the lesson that you want him to learn. But something happens when they get it, right? Like, like there's the parenting win that you can go and celebrate behind their back. Like, yo, that was good parenting. Where did that come from? Or maybe even on the job. You felt like you'd just been spinning circles, getting passed over for opportunities, not getting a job that you applied for. And I tell you that there is a reason to God delaying things. In fact, if you wanted to go into the very beginning of this travel in the wilderness, per se, God actually tells his children, well, he tells them that I'm going to lead them around instead of through Philistine because if they saw the battle that was coming for them, they wouldn't go through it. So sometimes your delayed progress is actually God's protection keeping you from something that you would have never walked through. So there's something about allowing God's sovereignty and His majesty and His direction to take root in your life because direction's in the middle. It has a name and His name is God. It seems to be the default answer, but a lot of times we'll turn to everything else in the middle. We'll turn to our own abilities to try to do something. And if I'm relying on my abilities to get me out of something I got myself in, then I'm going to struggle for a hot minute in the middle. So we feel like we're walking in circles. It seems like it'll never end when you're walking in circles, right? When's this ever going to end? And so let me give you some encouragement. Let me give you some hope. And in the next five minutes, the worship team's going to come up here. We're going to have a time of response together. And then I'm going to release you by 11.05 because I want to honor our time together. Is that good? Y'all setting your clock. Y'all watch me. I got a big confidence clock there. The thing's huge. <laughs> it's a little behind the stage access. I said, man, John remembers everything he puts. No, I don't. I got a confidence monitor right there. <laughs> Tells me what to say next. But let me give you some encouragement in the middle for direction in the middle. Here's one thing that you need to realize, and don't underestimate this, that God never stops leading. God never stops leading. He never stops. In a 40-year season in the wilderness for the children of Israel, can I tell you that God never relinquished control to anyone? In a season of delay that you may be experiencing now, can I tell you that no one else is leading that? 
that God's always leading. In fact, we see it with the children of Israel in Exodus 13, 21. It says, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. If God never stops leading, but we keep delaying, then guess what happens? We stop following. We stop following. See, something happens along the way that maybe God is protecting us from something or bringing something out of us, challenging us. There's a lot of times when a challenge faces us, I'm going to just be honest, some of us, man, we've been so beaten down by life, the next challenge, we just want to quit. We don't even want to deal with it. And so if there's a recognition, direction in the middle is to remind yourself that, God, I know you're always leading I know that you would never leave me nor forsake me. God, I know that your mercy goes before me. God, I know that you have plans for me, plans to prosper. As the Jeremiah 29, 11 says, but here's the deal. Let me just kind of clean up some, some, some conception of that, of that verse. I love that verse. It's a great encouraging verse. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. Did you know the plan at the time was exile? <laughs> The plan of, of the time wasn't just to step into freedom and, 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 and millions and provision and prosperity. The plan was, hey, I got plans for you to prosper you, uh, but you're going to deal with exile. And so some of us just need to recognize and realize that, that it's not God punishing us. In fact, a lot of seasons that we go through that are hard, that we feel like God has put on, on us, it's really God protecting us in that. As he's leading us through things, God never stops leading. Even though we may stop following, the psalmist reminds us in Psalms 37, 23, that the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hands. See, that's the great thing about being in the middle, (laughs) in the season that we live in. See, could you imagine being in the wilderness without knowing the rest of the story? Could you imagine holding on to the hope of a Messiah for 400 plus years, never hearing anything, and then all of a sudden Jesus shows up? See, we know who wins this thing. We know what the cross at Calvary did for us. Right? And so there's something about the middle and directions that we're looking for to maybe stop walking in circles and start concentrating on heaven saying, God, you're leading this. What am I missing? What am I not seeing that you have, that you have before me? What, Lord, what is it? If you're, if you're guiding me and you're protecting me, then what am I missing? What am I missing? In fact, if you go to the New Testament, Paul, when he talks about his account of the road to Damascus, you know, there was a light that blinded him from heaven, and then he journeys on with the words that were spoken. And, and as he's, 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 re-accounting, he's, he's recalling these events, when he's on trial and he says, this is Paul's words. Paul says that I heard a voice from heaven and the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you kicking against the goads? Why are you kicking against the goads? A lot of times in the middle, we're kicking against the goads. So like, well, what does that even mean, John? <laughs> well, there's a term, a, 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 a farm tool. It's an ox goad. And an ox goad is this instrument I can't just, I almost walked and there were no steps right there. That would have been, would have been bad. Um, let me get a new friend for something. Can I use you, Kevin, man? Come on, come on. So, Kevin, you're going to play Saul. Eventually, Paul. So you got to be a bad dude before you're a good dude, you know. <laughs> but he says, he says, why are you persecuting me? Why are you kicking against the goats? And so here's what that looks like. An ox goat is a farm tool. And it's, it, it has a flat end and a pointy end. And if I'm the farmer and you're the ox and I need you to go into that field, then what I would do is I'd brace myself with the flat end against me and the pointy end facing him. Stubborn oxen. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> but if, if you walk towards me and there's this, this pointy sharp object, it hits him. And he goes back. I need him to go into that field. So then he walks back towards me. And it hits him. And he goes back. He's walking in circles. He comes towards me. And it hits him. He's kicking against the goads until eventually something breaks. And he says, you know what? I'm going to go this way. Thanks, man. That's good. Appreciate you. 
Um, a lot of times in ordering our steps, we find ourselves like a stubborn oxen <laughs> trying to go this way. And God in his mercy and his grace and his patience would position himself to direct and guide our paths. At some point, doesn't it get tiring running into dead ends, running into sharp objects? I wonder what would happen if we stopped being so stubborn and started looking up and saying, okay, God, you're guiding this thing. See, he's always with us. Acts 13, 16 through 18, standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt with might and power. He led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. See, earlier we read about the anger that burned in God. He kept his people wandering for 40 years. Now, Paul gives us a perspective of grace and patience, and he says that God would allow them 40 years. He endured it. Are you thankful that we serve a God that endures our mistakes? Are you thankful that we, endure, that we serve a God who endures our mess-ups? Are you thankful that when we spill the glass of milk that our God doesn't yell at us and beat us? Honestly, man, I'm so tired of seeing people hurt within the walls of the church because you messed up. His grace is sufficient. He's always with us. Well, why are you saying that today? Because I think that some of us struggle with abandonment issues. You've known nothing more than people walking out on you. I felt it so strong in my heart when I was writing these words down that I knew that this would be a moment that someone, maybe you haven't listened to anything I've said but you're going to lean into this. Maybe the delay is a result of your abandonment issues. What does that look like? As I was thinking about abandonment, I was thinking about maybe the one present, but you had parents walk out on you. Maybe you had a spouse walk out on you. Maybe you had a church turn its back on you. Maybe you've had people that said that they would be there with you, that they're your ride or die, that they're going to go through anything with you. And they left you. And because there's been abandonment, the thought of a God who's always present, who's always near, who is for you, not against you, is so foreign. I'll tell you that the enemy has been working overtime to keep you from the goodness of God because he knows once you taste and see that the Lord is good, that you'll come back for seconds and you'll come back for thirds and you'll come back for fourths because his grace is sufficient. And so if your abandonment issues have been a result of hurting the church, hurting your home, hurting your marriage, hurt on the job. Can I tell you that God is greater? That God is better? That God never left you in that season? A lot of times you can look and say, yeah, John, let me make it personal. <laughs> I got angry, man, with God. I was like, God, where were you? When my wife and I found out that we couldn't have kids. That's all my wife ever wanted was to have a kid. God, where were you? Like, why can't that happen for us? And then the whole time that I'm complaining about things not working out the way that I saw them, God opens up a door and he gives us our son full time. Tyler, you are an answered prayer, buddy. We prayed for 10 years that I would get to have you every day. And in God's grace and in his mercy and in his sovereignty, he made a way for Brandy to be a mom even when we didn't see it happening. Why? Because our God is faithful. He's faithful. So what's on us to do? Step into the promise of God. Step into it. Step into it. Exodus 3, 16 through 17, this was the promise at the beginning. I've watched over you and I've seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Obedience is seen when we step into the promise of God. The issue for 40 years was there was a generation that was afraid to step into what God had called them to. 
I don't want to wait 40 years to step into what God has already promised in the beginning of the story. I know the next chapter. I know that God wins. I know that his love is enough. I know that his grace is sufficient. And so what would happen when we step into this? What would happen when we would step into territory that the enemy's trying to keep us from because he knows that God is establishing a church that the gates of hell will not prevail against. And if the church would step into it in obedience, then we would see our streets cleaned up. We would see our cities met and the needs taken care of. What happens when we occupy all streets? We shut down the schemes of the enemy. Bow your heads with me this morning. For us to step into the promise of God, the first thing we need to understand is the promise of eternal life. That was given to us, not on any of our merit or any of our work, but completely on a work of grace and his mercy. John 3, 16 spells out a lot for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believed in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Some of us are walking in circles, guiding our own paths. And the step to freedom is the acceptance and the acknowledgement of your need of a savior. Repentance to turn your way, to change one's mind. I'm not going to draw this thing out or make it a big spectacle or ask you to repeat a prayer after me, but just in a moment of celebration with you, if you're in the house this morning and there's an acknowledgement of your need of a Savior, and you're like, you know what, John? God hasn't guided any of my steps that I've seen so far, but His grace and His mercy has been sufficient enough to delay death, to give me an opportunity to say yes to life, and so I'm here this morning. And I don't know where eternity would be spent if I walked out of these doors and it ended, but I want to solidify that today by acknowledging my need of a Savior, repenting and turning towards Him. John, would you celebrate with me? Would you simply slip your hand up and slip it down? I'm not going to call you up. I'm not going to call you out, but I want to celebrate with you. Anyone? The second issue I really felt strong on was abandonment. The delay of stepping into your freedom or stepping into your promise has been a, a wound of abandonment. With eyes still closed and heads still bowed, just honoring the moment of sincere transparency. It's like, John, you know what? That's me. I struggle with abandonment. And I need prayer. I see hands already going up in the back. I see hands everywhere. Would you guys stand with me? Everyone, everyone stand. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray. And you've already given me four minutes of overtime. Five is the number of grace, so I've got one more minute with you. I'm going to pray and I'm going to to honor your time and then let you guys go. But for those that have responded on the abandonment issue, Jared, if you wouldn't mind, man, I don't even know if you've got to move to another instrument or I can slide a mic to you and we can lead a worship moment together. Um, But I don't want to rush what God wants to do. I think that there are some people that have been walking in abandonment long enough. God's going to do some things. It says in his word that he's faithful to continue the work that he started. So today can be that continued work. And I'm going to pray and I'll dismiss us and then turn it over to Jared to lead us in worship as you guys are leaving. On your way out too, John, you guys don't pass offering buckets. No, we we decided not to do that at this location. Uh, We worship on our way out. We believe that, that tithes and offerings is a sign of obedience and generosity and that you can worship on your way out. There'll be baskets in the back that you can drop your connect cards in, drop your offerings in on the, on the way out. But I'm going to pray and then dismiss you guys. And, and I'll be up front. Any elders, uh, anyone that's part of our prayer team that has prayed with people, we'd love for you to join us up front. And let's, let's spend some time helping some people find some freedom. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. God, that your mercies are new every morning. God, I pray for the many people that have responded, God, to acknowledging just a sense of abandonment, whether it be from a family member, whether it be from a spouse, whether it be from the church. God, there's none of us so broken that your grace can't meet us where we're at. And so, God, I pray that as we separate and go our separate ways, that you would continue the work that you started. And for those that need to go, God, I pray that you just give them even more opportunities to participate in moments of grace. Father, we love you and we're so thankful and honored to be part of this season here at Church of the Crossing.
It's in your son's name the church says. Amen. Be blessed, guys. 10 o'clock next week in the middle, we're closing out the series. If you need to leave, go ahead and leave. If you need some prayer.